Welcome back to Alter Ego Television. I'm Ronan and we're joined by Mikey Matania. If social change was a battle between the light and the dark, which it is, Mikey Matania would be a lightsaber. He wouldn't even be a Jedi. He'd be the thing that people pick up in order to defeat the darkness. Uh, today we're talking about the new vision for politics that is emerging, which is a vision of society where rather than meeting our material needs, we actually meet our social, emotional, psychological and spiritual needs. And that's really the next paradigm of development. And I'm with someone who's really at the front lines of that and is doing with people who are suffering most under the present system. So Mikey, can you please maybe just tell us a little bit about your work and why it makes a difference? Firstly, can I just thank you for comparing me <laughs> to my all-time favourite object? Mikey, uh, one of the reasons that I'm really fascinated to talk about you is because you take personal growth and spiritual growth, these ideas that are the kind of fascination of very privileged people and you're actually taking them to parts of society that are most affected um, and most vulnerable and people who are suffering most. Mm -hmm. And I feel you have a really deep insight into why that is needed and also how to do that work. So could you maybe just uh, share a little bit about what you do? Yeah, man. Uh, so I've spent the last three years working for a mental health charity called Mind and we were funded by the Department of Health to go and do this work with young people. Like, how do you help young people improve their social and emotional health? And so we ended up training like 150 volunteers and then they went and trained like 16,000 young people mm. in how to improve this aspect of their lives. This, this aspect which is genuinely ignored mm. in the public arena to a large degree, historically. And only now is it starting to make its way into the national debate. So we're at this like, like kind of transition moment where up until now we've had this understanding of progress that's been about our material needs. You know, get someone a job, give them a good welfare state and life will be happy. And what we're discovering obviously now is that there's a whole inner world of pain and trauma and a whole lot of social and emotional needs that aren't being met. And actually this makes a crucial difference both to people's lives and to society. So what do you find when you actually go in to... Um, I so suppose like into classrooms and into schools uh, with people and like what are they actually experiencing and how does the mindfulness practice that you bring make a difference? Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, most young people, I mean, first and foremost, right, we always start a workshop by just like laying our own cards down and explaining to them the history of our own suffering as well. Mm. Uh, all of us have had mental health problems on this project, right? And so we're just straight up front about that. And you just see the relief on young people's face where it's just like, finally, someone being flipping real, right? Mm. Uh, because young people live in a world of masks. Mm. Uh, their teachers wear masks. Their parents wear masks. Their peers definitely wear masks, right? Mm. I mean, remember yourself at 14, 15, 16, man. Like, and it's carnage being a young person at that age. And so we start just by being authentic mm. and just saying, you know what? This is me at my most vulnerable. Mm. And what do you say to them? I mean, I will just share with them about my history of mental illness. I'll tell them that I spent years living in a world of paranoid delusions and what it took to sort of claw my way out of that place and the years that I spent buying into this story of hyper-aggression and toxic masculinity, so-called, mm. uh, and my peers, and, and what that did to my capacity to feel and my capacity to love and feel love. Mm. And so I share with them my journey through that and the descent into that and how I found my way out of that. And I tell you, man, you can walk into a, a classroom and you can have like the most aggy attitude young people like, <laughs> like folded arm brigade, right? And as soon as you drop that, straight away, the whole atmosphere flips. And we trained 16,000 young Londoners, right? And there was not a single case of that not happening. It was mm. the biggest surprise for us that truth recognises truth. That's what we learned. Young people completely tuned into that and it, they opened and softened and mm. that opened a window for us to be able to take our messages in, which is like, guys, learn how to meditate. Learn how to look at yourselves because we spend our lives with our attention fixed on the world out there. The problem's out there. And of course, yes, there are a lot of problems out there. And a lot of the young people I work with, many of them are in gangs and the out there can be a very hostile place. You know, part of the reason I developed mental health problems in the first place was that 
I viewed the world as a hostile place. Mm. But also, there's a hell of a lot that we're contributing to. Our beliefs, our unexamined assumptions about life, about how things work, about how to relate to people that mm. we never challenge unless we look at it first. Mm. And so this isn't encouraged in young people. You have some young people who are making this journey by themselves, like myself, maybe through their own personal challenges, but there isn't necessarily in most schools a systemic view. Mm. There exists within the education system an inner dimensional blindness, which is a term coined by the, the Listening Society book uh, by the Meta Modern guys. And I just thought they, that just mm. nailed it. I was like, yes, that's it. We need to factor into account this world. And it's invisible, yes. But just because it's invisible, it doesn't mean it's not there. And there's something really profound about this. Because what you're having, what you're seeing in society, is almost a statewide recognition. These are funded programs by the Department of Health. A statewide recognition of the suffering that all of us are experiencing because of a cultural story that traps us in some way. Yeah. And so for me, that when I hear that story of you going into a secondary school and being vulnerable and saying, yeah, this is me, and everyone breathing a collective sigh of relief, that's the birth of a new political story. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's it. It's literally, that's the starting point. The, the, the first thing we need to take out is the culture of silence. Mm. Because as long as everyone's keeping their stuff to themselves... Everyone thinks it's just them. And that is the main thing that we get back from young people in our feedback forms. The main thing we get back is, I now know it's not just me. Wow. And that was big. You know, when we saw that in our analysis, we were just like, wow, okay. And that's why you have organisations like Time to Change who are trying to start conversations about mental health, which is basically just inner dimensions, and bring that out into the public forum in workplaces, in schools, and just literally going out onto the streets as well across the UK and... The work that they've done has been amazing in, in starting that conversation. You're seeing the ramifications of it now. They've taken on the culture of silence from a seemingly unassailable position and forced it down to a degree where you have workplace wellbeing programs now basically as a standard. Mm. And so although many of it many of these interventions might be sort of tokenistic, at least it's on the agenda now. Mm. Well, I think it gets to an insight that if we think about a new vision of progress for society, that has to be something that is felt and that people recognise to be true for themselves and that they want. In the same way that material progress was born from people's lived experience of, shit, my life is getting really good with this job and with this welfare state that supports me when times are tough. And it feels like now what we're experiencing is this awakening to, shit, I'm, I'm quite a vulnerable, wounded person. I've got like... I've got shit from childhood that really plagues me and actually I understand how the cultural story of material success is in some way conspiring in keeping me in that place and I want to break free of that for my own fulfilment and happiness. Yeah man, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is challenge the stories mm. and actually not just challenging the stories but presenting them with new ones or I say new ones, old ones that we've forgotten mm. and reintroducing those stories like the idea that, you know, is it so crazy to assume that human beings as tribal beings for most of our history on the planet might need social connection and deep connection to feel understood by our peers and to be able to bond in a way that's actually emotionally vulnerable rather than just wearing masks? Is it so absurd that we need to move our bodies and develop a, and cultivate a sensitivity to our bodies? Maybe something like yoga might be a good idea. Does it make us surprised to know that perhaps... Hmm. rather than just trying to solve our own problems and getting lost in the story of me, we should be reorientating our attention to be able to support and help those around us so that they can experience the benefits of us and we can start seeing how much of a service we can be from in the world and develop a self-esteem and self-confidence from that. It's like, no, this is not rocket science. This is really basic stuff. And the, the thing is, is that there's a competition for our attention as human beings. And... There are so many things competing for our attention that for these very simple ideas to, to get airtime, it's difficult, but it's super important that we somehow find a way of, of, of reaching, particularly the younger generations, because they have less resistance to the ideas. Mm. You know, if I go into a workplace, I have to talk about resilience, mm. and resilience is mental toughness, and that's generally the only way that you can get through people's intellectual resistance to try these very simple ideas that actually young people would just fibre straight away because it just makes sense. And I think what we're seeing is that this idea of taking spiritual and psychological growth seriously and having the development of the self as being almost the primary driver of your life 
Now that's coming out of the private domain. That's coming out of people doing it in workshops and retreats. And it's actually the state recognizing shit. The social potential of this is absolutely enormous for addressing all the problems that we face, be it climate change or inequality, that actually we're cultivating people who feel whole and fulfilled and take responsibility for their lives and ultimately stop holding themselves and each other back. And so this is the seed of a new vision that people are experiencing uh, in the, some of the toughest areas of London that Mikey is playing his part as a Jedi Knight uh, in, in bringing about. Um, uh, so we hope you found it uh, helpful and useful. In terms of how you can be a part of this new political story, it's by being vulnerable and authentic with the next person you meet. It's by just dropping the mask and going, actually, I'm having a bit of a shit day uh, and uh, things aren't going well for me. And that there's something about the truth recognizing that that creates uh, a place of renewal. Mm -hmm. Thank you.